because I came into marriage. Ain't no man, you know, like going to talk to me like that. Ain't no man going to treat me like that again. And my sweet, gentle husband just kindly, patiently earned my respect in a way that I couldn't help but give it. And that that brought me to a crossroads where I had to decide, am I going to turn around and get the story straight about my family of origin, where I've come from, why I still do the things I do today, or am I going to buckle down and and just say, I'm right, this has worked for me, uh, there's, you know, I'm doing fine, I'm successful, yeah. I'm doing these things. Yeah. And so it's not about turning around to shame or blame or to write off our parents or those other authority figures who may have hurt us. It really is about getting the story straight so that we can move on from this point. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Along the Way Life's Journey. I'm your host, Carl Bucciolato. You know, often I say I traveled all around the world in this 81 years of life that I've had, and I've met very interesting people. And some of the people I've brought here to this show because I believe they have a message of hope and motivation that will lead many other people to follow in their path and find recovery or find wellness and health. And I have such a young lady here today. Her name is uh, Amber Jones, and she is the founder of Grace Story Ministries. Amber, is uh, she considers herself a, a friend during the journey, and I think that's an interesting thing we'll talk about. She's also an advocate for families and people, individuals who are seeking help and restitution in their life in some way or other. And she is a, also a speaker and author, and she has created many, many stories and work attributes that can bring back uh, individuals to a place of soundness. And she does so from her own story. She has a story from her youth that was traumatic, and it helped change her and grow into the person she is today. But beside all of that, you will note, she's a lovely young lady. She's the mother of four children. Can you imagine that? And she's married to a high school sweetheart, who is also a beef rancher in central rural Michigan. Y'all married a cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. And she has uh, created uh, a wonderful program that I think is uh, going out internationally through the podcast. And enough of that from me. We want to hear from you. Welcome, Amber, to the show. Welcome to our show, Amber. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here and share a conversation with you. Um, it's always a joy to be able to share what God is doing through my story, um, which ultimately, as we know, is is his story. And so, yeah, it's always a joy to be able to share a bit about that. So you were not a, a rural country girl. You were born or raised in Cincinnati. <laughs> no. So I, you were a city girl. <laughs> I was full city girl. I like to say um, my class in high school would not have voted me most likely to be a farmer's wife. <laughs> um, things were gross and I would have much rather, you know, the coffee with friends than the mucking a barn. But um, I think that that's part of what is so interesting about what God, if we will literally, if we will just surrender to what he's doing, and that took me a while <laughs> to come to that mm -hmm. point, yeah. but um, how we can live our unexpected best life. We often hear like, I'm living my best life, right? Sometimes our best life can be unexpected. And that's how it was for me. Um, I used to tease Darren, my husband, who um, is a large animal veterinarian. So he gets asked a lot, have you seen Dr. Paul? Do you know him? He's from Michigan too. Um, he, he has worked in the same region as him. I knew he was going to be a veterinarian when I was back in the city growing up in Cincinnati, just miles from downtown, right where the riots happened, all of those things. And um, I said, well, as long as Walmart is not a day trip where it's like, get dressed up, kids, we're going to Walmart for the day. Um, <laughs> and I like to say he slow boil frogged me where uh, we were about 25 minutes. Then we were, you know, maybe 30 minutes. And my now- jet. <laughs> Walmart is indeed a day trip. We're a good 40 <laughs> minutes from town to even say town, you know. Um, I feel like I've lost my city girl card full on and uh <laughs> embrace this life. But what a great place to raise kids. 
we do have four children. Um, they're from ages eight to my son, who I've nicknamed NASCAR because he just turned 16 and is driving. He does a great oh. job, though, because he's been driving here at the farm for a while now. So yeah. he's got a good good bit under his belt. But um, what a fun place. And having come through, um, you know, the the COVID pandemic, and it felt like a lot of what people were working through during that time of feeling socially isolated, buying their groceries, you know, in bulk and trying to stay away. And I felt like I had already experienced some of that about 12 years ago when we moved out here to the farm. Yeah. And so I felt a certain level of empathy, like, wow, I, I have been through that. Now we have our life adjusted to that kind of a rhythm. And um, so it wasn't quite as, you know, we were we were kind of truly off the grid more with regard to some of those things that people were facing where kids had to just play in their own driveway it, and that was it, not see friends. And um, and so it felt like I was able to minister some from a place of of having lived that. And that's really where Grace Story comes in. Overall, Grace Story has been a place that I created out of my own story, of a place of living something and realizing we're not alone in this. There's so many more people who live this often secretly every day and you don't know how to get help. Um, they don't know exactly where to start. And so to go back a little bit, there in Cincinnati, talking about growing up, I grew up on a Bible college campus, a small Bible college campus of, oh, I don't know, maybe 200. Um, wow. And that had like, <laughs> yeah. So when I say That's small, small <laughs> I mean small. <laughs> Um, uh, the, the college was, um, focused on very, tr very traditional values. And so my family looked the part and, um, my dad was the public relations director there. And so even more so image really mattered for our family and what we portrayed. So as I grew up, I knew that that was something that was going to be important that I, hold the part, that I look the part, that um, that I hold our family secrets well. Because behind closed doors, there was a completely different story happening that nobody would have known about. That is the part where you, when you are growing up in something that has trauma, abuse, um, on multiple levels, it's not usually just one box. It's not usually just a physical or just a spiritual. It's almost more of that Venn diagram, right? Where everything yeah. kind of Right. leaks into each other and, right. and kind of overlaps and Christian music is playing in the background while this is happening. And so it all just kind of gets a little fuzzy. And that's how it was. Without going really specifically into my story, let's just say that that view that I began to curate of, it's not safe to be honest. It's not safe to be who I am, to read a room really well. And I know a lot of um, trauma survivors are very intuitive people. They can sense sense something right away when they step into a room right. or know something, discern something about a person that feels off. And that's a lot of times where it ends up being left is the situation feels off. The person feels off. But we never take the time. We often don't take the time to dig into, is there something more possible here? if we were to address why things feel off or why our family maybe feels different than that other family that I visit after school, you know, and their home feels safer for some reason. Mm -hmm. Well, when you're in those environments, it isn't, it isn't safe to address as, as a teenager. It isn't safe to, to dig into some of those things. So as I got married, um, I began to see how those survival ways of communicating, of uh, defense. I came into marriage, ain't no man, you know, like going to talk to me like that. Ain't no man going to treat me like that again. And my sweet, gentle husband just kindly, patiently earned my respect in a way that I couldn't help but give it. And the, that brought me to a crossroads where I had to decide, am I going to turn around and get the story straight about my family of origin, where I've come from, why I still do the things I do today, or am I going to buckle down and and just say, I'm right, this has worked for me, uh, there's, you know, 
I'm doing fine. I'm successful. Yeah, I'm yeah. doing these things. Yeah. And so it's not about turning around to shame or blame or to write off our parents or those other authority figures who may have hurt us. It really is about getting the story straight so that we can move on from this point. And that's what I did. I took time to go into trauma processing and did a lot of those those things. And as I came out of it, I was asking God, do you want me to write a book? You know, is this a, something where, how do you want me to share this story of how surprising your grace was showing up in those surprise moments when I didn't even know it, that you were at work, when I didn't know that you were showing up, when those times as a teenager, I would try to, I mean, I grew up on a Bible college campus, right? I heard all the ways to connect to God. I mean, you fast, you pray, you sing the hymns, you memorize scripture, you all the things, and none of them were working. And for me, I, I thought, well, if this is what you do to connect with God and it's not working, then it must be me, right? There must be something about me that is causing God to be indifferent towards me. This must not be enough faith. And so I gave up praying for a really long time. I was still yeah. very sincere. I was scared yeah. out of my mind of hell. That that had been instilled. Yeah, the in deceiver me. has a way of doing that, turning it around to make it seem like it's your fault. Yes. Yes, yes. I'm aware of that. <laughs> <laughs> and so I spent a lot of time striving, right? Women's ministry, teaching, um, begging these women if you knew how intimate God wanted to be with you, how much he cares about you and, and you have this opportunity I've tried. And I, I just, I know, I believe this for you. And there came that point where I, I asked God the question, okay, I'm, I'm not going to keep teaching. I'm, I want to know who you are really not the God I've been handed through a distorted father narrative but who are you really yeah and that was at the beginning of that trauma processing journey yeah and when i came to the end of it i realized like well part part way through there were those moments where i was like i know you're going to redeem this story can we just get to it like <laughs> do we really have to go through all of this stuff? Yeah, isn't there a it's shortcut i can take <laughs> and my if husband if i turn left me, will i end up yeah <laughs> right my husband looked at me part way um, I was talking to him about this, kind of complaining a bit, right? And he's like, so let me get this straight. You want to hurry up and be so that you can do. <laughs> Sounds like maybe there's a little more work there. I was like, yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> yeah. A little uh, bit of pride and vanity hooked into that thing yeah. somewhere. <laughs> yeah. But God's answer to that was just so gentle. He said, you know, it's really not about how we're going to have an outpouring of this, like what this looks like outward, because that is, that is secondary. First of all, I want to restore this relationship that you have with me, this vertical you and me that has been distorted. And I want to restore that. So with Grace Story, we often talk about the journey of restoration. And what is that? That is restoring back to that relationship, way back to Genesis that God intended where he he wanted to walk with us freely right. without shame right. and that's where we're getting back to right so when you you mentioned a few times you went through the trauma processing and uh, i'm sure that there were some groups available to you that you utilize uh, there are various different types of trauma some of them have to do with physical abuse emotional abuse substance abuse you know all those kinds of things in families that get hidden under the blanket that people don't talk about, but they're all there. And uh, at at one time or another, uh, people who are raised in that kind of an environment reach out with hope and hopefully find some kind of an organization that can help them. I'm familiar with that because I did many years attending ACOA, Adult Children of Alcoholics, and I, I know very well what those kind of programs are like, yeah. and I know the benefit of them. I know that uh, uh, when you start into this thing, you know, originally you just want to feel better. You just, right. you just want it to stop. You know, yes. you just want to be able to say, I'm going to wake up today. It's going to be a better day. I'm going to smile today, you know? Yeah. And then after a while that you, you start to find God in your life and he embraces you and you start to realize 
you start believing God does not make junk. So I can't be junk. It can't be right. me. I'm not junk, you know? Right. And as that happens, you see a pathway where what you learn, you can give to others and hopefully make a difference in this world, you know? Yeah. And I, I see that's what you're talking about now, right now. Yeah. So as I ask God, how do you want me to share my story? Is this a book? Is this um, just becoming traveling and speaking? Um, I was sitting out here on my 40 acre beef farm here in central <laughs> Michigan that we mentioned on a Sunday afternoon. And I just felt like God just poured out this vision for what grace story could be because there's power in relatable story. And That's we had sad. shared our family story a little bit. And at the end of those times of sharing, people would come up and say, wow, this is, I think this is my family. Mm -hmm. And I've never heard this honesty before mm -hmm. in the church and what to do about it. And at that point, we didn't have an answer. So as I thought about the power of relatable story and how that opens people up to, to being a little more vulnerable about their need for help, right? The the important follow-up key that Grace Story does differently is in our conferences, on our podcast, it's not just about opening people up, but it's also pairing that relatable story in real time with counselors. So if we share a story on um, attempted suicide or domestic violence or miscarriage or any of these traumas that can happen that can be hidden or can be um, hard to find help for if you're if you don't know where to start, then we'll follow that up in real time with a master's level instructor who then comes in and kind of brings it down to an, an accessible shelf. Takes all these kind of the codependence, all these these kind of hard big words that we hear. But what does that mean to me? Right. What does that actually look like? Right, and it's uh, such a practical thing because I've seen so many of these programs where people come to a place where they're opened up and they know there's an issue there but you know other than people saying to them well pray there's no they don't have an answer they don't have a guide that's been trained to carry them through that and that's why i was so impressed with what you're doing you seem to have put together an organization of the practical and the faith-filled and that's very important yeah that balance is very important and we see it so we have each year um we just launched our men's conference in the first weekend of May, and then we have women's conference the first weekend in November. Those are always in the Cincinnati area. And we see that. And I know I've heard you talk about it on your podcast before, but the value of community, because without the community where you feel like I have people, I have someone, because a lot of us, let's, let's be honest, a lot of us have lost what feels like our people in the process of healing. And that's not what we expected. No, we didn't expect. No, we thought no. we would, you know. I heard one of your recent guests say about this this uh, journey of reconciliation, right? And it takes both sides, and we don't always get that. And so, having a group of people where you you're like minded. Now, it's it's a diverse group of people as far as faith background. We've got all the faith backgrounds represented in our group. Um, women's runs about two to two fifty. Our first year of men's, we had just over a hundred men. Which a hundred men showing up, knowing they're there to work on mental health That's and a change, big accomplishment. <laughs> change their That's family legacy. <laughs> and you could see that hesitation as they would walk in. Um, you know, there was just that, what am I doing here, right? And yeah. they'd come in as ones. We have a pre-bash where we have axe throwing, cornhole tournaments, car show. You know, we we have that. That's how we start men's because that sense of camaraderie, like, okay, we've bonded over this. Yeah. If they had walked right into the auditorium where it's dark the and light. masks lights, would be on so solid. Men but, wear masks to, to protect, defend themselves, to protect right. themselves. You know, we're supposed to be give this image of the stronger gender, you know. Yeah. It, that's why they put the mask on. I know that. It's one thing to protect my wife who's been through trauma. It's another to admit, hey, I was that little boy. Yeah, right. I was that little boy who, and and these are stories, true stories of men who come. And I told them this year, you were some of the bravest men I know. Because to turn around and look that little boy in the face, that younger part of yourself who says, look, I have tried to figure it out for so long, but I didn't have a daddy to show me the way. 
And I'm still, there's still a part of you inside that says, I want to do it right so sincerely. And some of that titanium wall yeah. is just that protector saying, I'm afraid I'm going to mess this up yeah. when my wife nags at me, you know, or whatever. And it's not that I don't sincerely want to step up and do better or do differently. It's that I don't know how. Right. And so what grace and story I'm is afraid coming? of failing. Exactly. Makes me look worse in my right. opinion. You know, so. Right. Right. And so what grace story is trying to do is step into that, that space. And um, my brother is part of this. He, he's the host of our podcast, uh, the grace story podcast. You can find that. But um, what he does is, is he just leads from the front. And that's what we say. This is not us in you. This is us saying we're with you in the trenches. Yeah. We remember what it's yeah. like to be just a couple steps b- back there where you are. And we're only at, we're doing this with you in real time. I just got back Monday from another three hours of trauma processing, right? Because there's always something that we can we can continue to work on to make sure. ourselves better. Of course. And the important thing is it sounds like both of you are willing to give the gift of vulnerability. You have to be vulnerable. You have yeah. to be, uh, there's a little book there on the shelf behind me. And the, that's a book that I wrote after I retired. It was the result of 50 years worth of journaling. Mm. Emotions and feelings that I would kept secret 50 years that I would never share with anyone. Yeah. My own children didn't even know those things. And a few years ago, uh, my wife said, you know, there's a lot of very good stuff in here. It could help a lot of people to write mm-hmm. a book. Good for and, her. <laughs> and to sit down and organize it was one thing. But to be willing to look at the parts that required real vulnerability. Right. Warts and all. You know? Not yeah. just some made up thing that people would look at and say, Oh, aren't you? None of that stuff. Real stuff. It yeah. took a lot of courage, I must admit. And I, I admitted myself. It took me hard time to think about it and pray about it and cry over it as an adult you know moments that came back over so many years yeah. and uh i wasn't sure i was going to do it but a, a good friend of mine who uh, is a survivor of vietnam agent orange and mm. he's been sick for so many years and he said to me you have to do it you have to be vulnerable and share it and it's the best thing i ever did i feel so confident about that and then the so many people contact me and they say, this is like my story. There were mm-hmm. issues in here I never could find an answer to until I read it, you know? Yes. You have to do these things. If you if you hope to be a servant of God and you hope to be thankful for what he's given you, you have to give it back. And yeah. sometimes it hurts. It hurts. But you have to do it anyway. So I applaud right. you, both you and your brother and your husband for supporting you, but you and your brother for being on the front line there and doing this. Thank you. And it's vulnerability is one of those interesting things because it can feel like, well, maybe this will make people feel less of me, right? Those are the things that, that attack our mind. Yeah. And what we see is it, op- it is such a gateway to hope because when we see that we're not alone in this, but it right. takes someone stepping up and going first. And I mean, I'm I'm 40. I'm not that old yet, but uh, that used to be old, right? Like when I was <laughs> 40 was the old age, right? And now I'm here and I'm like, well, no. No, not at all. <laughs> but, but one of the things I think through this leadership process that I'm discovering is the value of a good mentor. And I think we have over overhyped what a mentor should be. And sometimes a mentor is just listening. It's someone being present with us and saying, yeah, I remember Mm -hmm. I was there. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes a mentor is saying, hey, speaking the hard stuff, but you have built that trust equity with someone through relationship to where you have then that, that ability, that permission to say hard things when the time comes, because we all need, we all need constructive criticism to continue to shape into who God wants us to be. And just as a person right trauma or no pro- trauma right. yeah. we need to grow but to have someone of value and and so i just really encourage our grace story community when i'm sharing with them don't underestimate that you don't have something to offer 
because your story is so valid. Whether you're 40, whether you're 80, uh, whether you're 16, and we have teenagers who come with their parents now to conference. And look, I tell my own kids as young as eight, you God has something for you right now, right now. Absolutely. And we can see that as they their innocence Absolutely. reminds us that the world is big, the world is creative, the world is beautiful. And the questions they come up with, because they come to conference, they're involved. It's a family ministry. They help run production, like with running a camera or running the merch booth. And they you know, hear them. I think if you take a DNA test, young lady, you're going to find the blood of Solomon in your blood. You're a very <laughs> wise person. You're a very oh. wise person. <laughs> oh, that it's, means it's so much very, coming. Very me. wise stuff you're talking about there. Good. Oh, thank you. Very the good. questions our kids come up with. And that to me is the blessing that comes. There has been yeah. incredible cost with yeah. leading something like this. Yeah. I started naive that the church would be grateful, right? The church would be grateful. We're coming along. We're serving a need that was there. And so we just, why me? Because I was willing, not, not overly qualified, but because I knew some people who could help people. And I had the willingness and love to step into this void. And it has cost us. We've had to leave our our former community, faith community. Um, we've had to switch churches. There's been different things like that that have cost us deeply um, within the last couple of years. And yet we see the benefits and what has grown us. And um, And sometimes it takes a little while to see that. Those wrestling moments with God were very real when these things began. I, I started this for you. I thought you were going to have my back. Mm. And here, are you going to abandon me too mm. when I'm so willing to just continue showing up? And I'll show up even if you're absent, but I can't do this without your strength. And to see how God has taken that pain, even that new kind of church trauma pain, and and shown me how it's actually bringing our family into the opportunity to serve a broader audience than um, just kind of the closed community I was a part of for a while okay. um, to be able to bring this to more people and to serve. And, you know, not in a vindictive way, but that that picture that Christ himself gave us of shake your sandals off, right? Shake That's the right. sandals off. That's right. It's not vindictive. No, no, that it's it's appropriate. He also said that a prophet is not known in his own town, which meant that some people are so close to you when you're growing up, they can't see beyond their own imagination or their own opinion. They yeah. can't hear the truth that you're speaking. So that's why you're supposed to shake the dust from your sandals and go on to people who will listen, because time is limited. It's not forever, you know, right. and we all right. know it's an end time environment that we're living in. So there are things we must do. Yeah. And we can't waste time with people that, you know, uh, I think of, you know, it, it just remind me of something. When I was a young man, we used to belong to a group of couples that would go together. You know, we went to uh, uh, marriage enrichment, marriage encounter programs, and we'd have after programs in the community. And we'd get together on a particular night of the week and we'd sit together and we'd talk about our experiences and we'd pray together. And it was pretty much the same group of people all the time. And one particular night, this couple came in late. They were, and it's laughing, I'm calling them an elderly couple now, but they were much younger than I am now. And they came in late and they sat down on the floor and I looked and I said, Rita, what's going on with you? She had this giant smile on her face. And she says, oh, nothing. I said, come on, Rita, tell us what's going on with you. She says, nothing, just God and I had this great laugh together today. Oh, Yeah. It stopped me in my tracks, yeah. changed my life. Those words changed my life because mm -hmm. she was speaking about a relationship with a living God. Yeah. Yes. And I wanted that more than anything. I wanted that. Yeah. And she changed my life. Uh, just a little thing like that. And that's the practical, the practical gospel. That's yeah. when we're living out the simplicity of what Jesus calls us to. That's right. And that's him living with people, living in relationship and saying, hey, and I love what Peter says um, as he's kind of coming to the end of 
in Second Peter, and he says, you know what? We knew Jesus firsthand. We knew him. And so if if you're not quite sure about this gospel yet, then let us hold that hope for you until the morning star rises in your own <laughs> hearts, right? And so as we were going through um, some of this dark, dark days in the last couple of years, that verse came to mind for me. And I, I'm, I love to garden here at the farm. And so I was like, surely there's a flower called the morning star, right? There's got to be a, a flower. And I found one. My son found it for me. And he's like, can you believe this? They'd sell this clump of grass. It just looks like nothing. <laughs> and uh, I was like, I've been looking for that. But it was on the discount rack at Menards, this discount flower. And I brought it home last fall, end of season. It still had green on it, so you can still plant it, right? And I planted that flower and I felt the Holy Spirit whisper to me, when this morning star rises, the, your hope will also be in a new place. So this summer, this spring, I, I had been watching and watching for those flowers to bloom. And I have to admit, I was a bit of a, a mess out there in my garden as I stand around and we've got just these these beautiful red Devon beef cattle that graze along the garden and the, you know, the perimeter of it. And then I've got this little white garden cottage that is also a gift from God. And I just stood out there in the midst of this haven that God has given us and was overcome with the blessing. And sometimes I almost feel guilty. Like why, why me? Why so much? And God is so faithful to whisper to whom I have given much, I require much. And he equips us. So he has brought the counselors who can help me be the leader I need to be and the mom I need to be. And this isn't um, extra doting. It's just him saying, I am good enough to equip you for this call that I've placed on your life. And so to the listener who's saying, well, I don't have that kind of a garden. I don't get those promises from God. It was a lot of work to be able to hear God in that way, because I would look at people just like you did and say, how do they hear him? How do they get, how do they get there? And, and I told my teenage story, but what that looked like is unpacking the rubble that imperfect humanity had placed on me, this, this wrong view of God, this trauma. And as I began to unpack that rubble, I began to see, oh, there's, there's something on the other side of this, right? And it's not that God was a far off. It's that God was actually right there unpacking the rubble with me. And, and when I got to a certain point, I could see there's eyeballs on the other side and they're smiling. And the, and eventually you, it's kind of like my kids who pack themselves full of stuffies, right? Like all these really soft animals and you got to kind of unbury them at night in order to give them a good night kiss. Eventually I realized not only is he not a far off, not only is he on the other side of this rubble and packing it with me, but that younger part of me that longed so much for a God who saw and cared has brought me to this point and has given me milestones just as he did the children of Israel to unpack and to leave those milestones so they could remember. And when I was ready, when I was safe, I could unpack that rubble with him and see he's holding me. He's not just standing beside me. He's holding me, unpacking this with me. And so to your listener that today is just like, but but I want that. I, I want that more than anything. I would do anything to have that. I've been there where the darkness is so dark, you almost feel physically dizzy yeah. from the vortex of trauma. And there's hope. There's actually a way to move out of that. But it, it isn't from a God who stands on the outside of the pit calling us like, hey, I've got a better life up here. If you want to come on out, here's a ladder. This but is you Jesus. you got to take a step on that ladder. You got to yeah. do your part. To me, absolutely I know, do. To me, I know that, uh, well, uh, I, I've come close to death many times in my life. And recent, about 11 years ago, I had a hemorrhagic stroke, half mm. inch bleeder in my brain. And they told my wife, he's not going to make it through the night. That's it. He's mm. through. And she said, oh, no. You don't know this man. He's not through. And uh, every day I get up and before I take my head off the pillow, I give thanks for God. Thanks to God for the, the gift of one more day of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm ready to go home to him whenever he's ready to take me. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yep. But I'm, I'm thankful for one more day of life. And at the end of the day, I do a, a, a reconciliation of the day in my own mind. And I say, okay, Lord, how did I do today? Mm -hmm. What did I do? The things you expected. Am I the man you wanted me to be? And if yeah. not, help me to be that person tomorrow. And you have to, for me anyway, I have to be in commune with him. I have yes. to read the scriptures. I have to be able to talk with him quietly in the garden, as they say. You know, it's an important, important part of it. You can't expect to be a Christian, a, a Christmas and Easter participant and, and just be abandoned or everything in between and expect to see him and know him. He's there. Right. He's there. But you just can't see him until you tune in, you know? Right. Right. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want to just, I know right now you're going crazy saying, how do I reach this girl? How do I find out more? All her contact information is going to be in the show notes. You're going to know how to reach her. You're going to know how, where to see, hear the podcast. You're going to know where, all that stuff where you can contact her, find out. I'm sure she'll send out bulletins to tell you when events take place and how to get involved. So it'll all be in the show notes for you. And I encourage you to reach out and do it because just as I said a moment ago, unless you do your share, yeah. it's not the, you know, it's not a, an observation tower. You're supposed to participate. Anything new coming up that you want to tell people about? Well, thank you. Um, yeah. So our next event that's coming up is first weekend of November, Grace Story Women's Conference. We have an incredible lineup again. Um, Natalie Runyon with Raised to Stay, Tara Matson with Living Wholehearted, um, and Dr. Carrie Anderson is going to come and talk about healthy eating um, from the disordered point of view and how we can um, take a better look at that. We have Carrie Trent Stageberg, Dr. John Trent's daughter, who's going to come and talk about her um, her experience with domestic violence and overcoming that and finding hope and ministry out, out of that. So um, that's the first weekend of November in the Cincinnati area. Our website, gracestoryministries.com, has all the information on that, as well as the men's conference that comes up as well. But uh, yeah, so we're just, we continue to find ways to build our community, to um, connect and inspire hope um, with the people who come along looking for it. That's marvelous. Uh, when we go offline, I want you to send me a uh, mailing address. There's a couple of things I want to send to you. Okay. One of them is a copy of this painting right there. You see that painting? Yes. My wife painted that painting 40 years ago. It's Christ holding the land. It's gone all over the world. Incredible. All Billy Graham used it as his centerpiece in two of his crusades. It's gone all over the world. And we like to give copies of them to people because we know what it means. And uh, yes, so I also have another little something I want to send from you. But you. Uh, uh, folks, listen, this is the kind of, this is the reason I have a show like this. This is why I won't take sponsors. This is why I have this kind of a show, because I want to be able to bring forth people like Amber, who tells you the kind of things you need to hear, will hopefully motivate you and bring you to a place where you want to know more, where you can dig in and get things moving. In addition to that, I want to tell you what I tell you every week. You have your own story. I know you have your story. Just like Amber has a story and I have my story and her brother. You have your own story. And no one can tell your story like you can. Make sure you tell your family and your loved ones. Write it down. Share it. Because when it's too late, it's too late. All that wisdom is lost. Share it while you can. The world needs to hear it. We've got a lot of blackness out there and we have to overcome it with the good things that we can talk about. Share your story. Now, we come up with a new show every Wednesday, first Wednesday and third Wednesday of the month. And we come up with wonderful guests like this. And if you have someone you'd like to recommend or yourself that you are doing something meaningful and you'd like us to consider it, write in. Let us know. And if you uh, are one of those people who like to write in and contradict things that they hear, which I get occasionally, let me know. I'll give you a platform. We can have a debate or a conversation online if you like. No way you're going to contradict this woman. I know that. So you want to have, a, have it out with me? Okay, let's do it. So I tell you also what I tell you every week, the most important message of this entire show. I know I'm a big blustery guy from Brooklyn, but it's very important. Love somebody today. Give them a big bear hug. Tell them you love them. It's very important. 
Love is the answer. Love somebody today. I love you, young lady. And I love what you're doing. Thank you. What a Thank gift. Thank you so much for being here with us. And I appreciate you and love you back. Bye-bye. So long, folks. See you soon.